Great to see you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to each and all of you. Appreciate you being here. Bad, thank you for that song. You know, we need to know God hasn't changed. He's the same today, yesterday, forever. God hasn't changed. And what God said He would do while we're on the mountain, God will still do that same thing while we're in the valley. And uh, we just need to have faith. Amen. Faith and trust God. When, even in those hard times that come into our lives, I, I dare say there's not a one of us that's not experienced a rough time sometime during our life. Each and every one of us, I think, has been there. Well, the first Sunday of each quarter is the Sunday that we set aside and we designate that we're going to take partake of the Lord's Supper. And so you see the, the table has been set up here in front of us, and we'll get to that here in just a few minutes, but uh, we want to so take some time and really think about what the bread and the juice represent. And so I want to draw your attention, if you would, first of all, turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. And I want to begin reading Matthew 26, 26. Now those of you who know your Bible, you know that before this took place, the disciples had asked Jesus about uh, the Lord's, or not the Lord's Supper, about the Passover meal, and Jesus told them to go into town and talk to someone, and he had set everything up, and uh, they did so, and then the disciples gathered there in that upper room, and they partook of that Passover meal, and Scripture tells us in one place that that supper being ended, Jesus brought forth the bread and the wine. The Bible tells us in Matthew's Gospel, and they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it unto them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father and our God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts <clears throat> this morning. Help us to focus upon your word. Help us, Lord, to see once more. To see vividly, Lord, that which your Son Jesus did for us. Father, to understand that we are the reason he went to the cross of Calvary. To understand, Lord, that he took our place. He paid the debt of our sin. That through faith in what Christ has done for us, we can be forgiven. And Father, not only forgiven, but Father, given the gift of eternal life because of your great love. Lead us now, our Father, direct us as we seek to study your word. Speak to our hearts in all things, dear God. Touch our souls this day for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22 and verse 19. Luke adds those words just to in remembrance of me. I think that's one of the keys as we think about the Lord's Supper. We need to understand what it is and what it's not. First of all, there's not anything that brings salvation in and of the elements that are here in the supper. There are those that teach that, that, you know, that the bread becomes the actual body of the Lord Jesus Christ and the juice becomes the actual blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, my friends, I don't think the New Testament teaches that. I think the Word of God teaches that these are symbols of the body of the Lord and of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Christ. And as often as we drink the cup, as often as we partake of the bread, we do remember the Lord. Amen. We remember what he's done for us. And my friends, he's done it all for us. We didn't deserve it. <coughs> we don't deserve it. We can't deserve it. We've talked about that so many times. There's none righteous, no, not one. Not one of us deserves to be <laughs> saved. But as the Gospel of John tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came, and he came, was born in that manger in Bethlehem. But my friends, we need to understand something. Even at his birth, he was destined for that cross of Calvary because that's why he came. He came to lay down his life for us. And here the supper was ended. And he got this bread, he got this juice, he gave it to his disciples, said, Eat this bread, remember my body that's given for you. You know, at that time, even though Jesus had numerous times had already told his disciples that he was going to go to the cross, it just didn't click. You ever had anybody tell you something you didn't want to hear? And it just didn't register up here? Well, some of you, like me, they can tell you anything that just doesn't register up here anymore, right? But here are the disciples, they didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear that Jesus was going to die. They, they saw Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah of God. And, and they, they, I think, still had in their minds what the Jews of that day were looking for, a Messiah who would come and kick the Romans out and shut up the earthly kingdom right then and there. But that's not what he came for the first time. Amen. He came to provide a way of salvation for all the world. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Not just for the Jews, but for all of us. Jew and Gentile alike, and all who would put their faith in what Christ has done, we might be saved and have everlasting life. And praise God for that. And here he was speaking to these disciples about that very thing. Now if you look all over in chapter 27, I want to start reading in verse 24. I'm going to read a lot of verses here for just a moment, but I want us to stop and think about the Lord's Supper, what it represents. And what it represents is what we're going to hear about. The Bible tells us in verse 24, chapter 27, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See, he took it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered to him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him, put on him a scarlet robe. When they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit upon him, took the reed and smote him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. As they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him that compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him. He parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. 
sitting down. They watched him there. Set up over his head, his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Save thyself, if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others himself. He cannot save. He be the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. He will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. Straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him the drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, Yielded up the ghost. <clears throat> Behold, the veil of the temple was written twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept <coughs> rose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And went to the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, they that were with them watching Jesus saw the earthquake, those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Amen. Truly, this was the Son of God. Now we look at that passage of Scripture and there's so many things we need to look at. Pilate, Pilate took the easy way out. If you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you read in all these different accounts, you find out that Pilate, as Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate very easily understood that he was there because of the envy of the Jews that Jesus had done nothing worthy of death. He was not guilty. And yet we find Pilate bowing to the people. Pilate bowing to that political pressure that was put on him. You know at one point some of the crowd said, you're not a friend of Caesar's if you let this man go. Pilate said time and again, I find no fault in this man. There's nothing wrong here. There's nothing evil that this man has done. And yet the crowd kept crying out, crucify, crucify, crucify. So Pilate called for a basin of water and he washed his hands. I thought I know the fault in this man. I washed my hands of him. You take him and do what you will. And then I think there was a very faithful statement made there. Verse 25 then asked all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. My friends, we're not just talking about the Jewish people. We're talking about all of us. Right. We are the reason Jesus suffered and died on the cross of Calvary. We are. Why? Because the word of God tells us that man has sinned and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And each and every one of us desires death and not only physical death but we deserve that spiritual death that separation from eternal God because we sin and come short of the glory of God. None of us have sought God as we should. The Bible tells us that. But praise God, we didn't seek Him, He sought us. Amen. And then
and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God so loved us that Christ came to show us the Father, to show us the way, and to provide a way through the shedding of His own blood. So he has, and his blood is upon all of us. We're all responsible for Jesus going to the cross of Calvary. Not just those in that crowd that cried out, Crucify! We least one of us. You recall Jesus and who was there in the Garden of Gethsemane? I still can't spell that word, by the way. I looked it up this morning. I had a hard time typing, even looking at it. But there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went and prayed and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, you stop and think about it. I think Jesus is the Son of Man. He wasn't looking forward to that cross. True. None of us were. None of us would be. But Jesus wasn't looking forward to what he knew was coming. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He understood that it was for that reason that he came. And Jesus went willingly to the cross of Calvary. Amen. I'll take a moment and, and stop and think about the sufferings that Jesus experienced at that time. The Bible tells us once Pilate had pronounced judgment on him, they took him and they scourged him. Literally, they took a whip and beat the hide off of him. Turned his back into a bloody pulp. And then they took him before the garrison there, three, six hundred soldiers, and they came in and they put him in the common hall and they made that, that crown of thorns and they pressed it down upon his head. And the Bible tells us they spat upon him. They mocked him. They hit him with their hands in places. It says they took a reed and hit him and they hit him on the head with that reed. Now remember on that head was a crown of thorns. So you know what that was doing? Tearing the flesh even more as the blood poured forth from our Lord and our Savior. And the Bible tells us that they did that and then they led him away to be crucified. Here the blows of the hammer today. As they laid our Savior upon that cross and they took those spiked nails and put in his hands and his feet and the blows of that hammer struck and struck and struck and drove those nails through the flesh into those boards. And then they stood him up. As that cross dropped into place and that body weight pulled against those nails. Think of the physical agonies that were suffered there. Think of those other agonies as, as those that walked by. The scripture says they wagged their heads. We don't do that too much. Now we see some do it, you know, like that. They wag their heads and 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 they belittle the Lord. Said, He's the Son of God. Let him come down. They were mocking him, hung him between two thieves. Those thieves mocked him. Yet you know, my friends, that wasn't the worst. You know, Pilate had a sign put up, I'm going to divert for just a moment, had a sign put up, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Jewish religious leadership didn't like that. <clears throat> That's one thing I have to say, Pilate did right, he said, what I've written, I've written, it stands. And you know, my friends, he was and is the king of the Jews, but he is the king of kings and lord of lords, this very son of God, Amen. nailed to that cross for us. The Bible says it was dark from noon to about 3, 3 p.m. In that darkness, I think, Jesus uttered some words that reflected the very worst of the suffering. He cried out, My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? I think it was at that very moment that God the Father placed on the spotless Lamb of God, our 
our sins. Amen. And he who knew no sin became sin for us. And there, for the first time in, in, in his life, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt the weight of that sin and that separation that sin brought. The Bible says he cried out with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. You know, I think John tells us what he cried.